Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Skip Reimer, Executive Director of Programs and Communications here at the Milken Institute. And since this is Veterans Day, for all of you veterans in the audience, we thank you for your service to your country. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, before we start, um, just a couple of items to let you know what the Milken Institute has been up to and will be up to. Uh, next week on the uh, 21st of November, we are going to have our annual California Summit with Governor Brown. This invitation only group uh, here at the Institute this year will discuss the challenges and opportunities facing us in the state. Our next forum is December 3rd with former Nevada Governor Bob Miller here to discuss his book, Son of a Gambling Man, My Journey from a Casino Family to the Governor's Mansion. And I can assure you it will be a lot of fun. So that's December 3rd. And finally, of course, we're working on our annual global conference, which is April 27th through 30th next April. Hope you can make it for that. A couple notes before we start uh, on today's forum. Uh, the book, uh, Startup Rising, is for sale with our folks over there at Barnes & Noble. Uh, Feel free at any time to go over during the program and go buy it. Um, Mr. Schroeder will sign copies after the end of the program today. And finally, as we do with uh, every forum, uh, if you want to ask questions, we take them by text and by URL, by email. So if you, there is, there's the numbers and there's the URL at any time from now until the end. If you have a question, just text that number or email that URL and uh, those will be shown up here on the screen. Just allows us to move a lot faster along, get more questions and answers in that way. So we're delighted to have uh, Christopher Schroeder, author of Startup Rising, The Entrepreneurial Revolution, Remaking the Middle East, to talk about his new book. And he will be introduced by today's moderator, Jonathan Spalter, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan. He is chairman of Mobile Future, which advocates for investment and innovation in wireless communications. Uh, he has an impressive career spanning both the private and the public sector. Uh, on the private side, he founded the investment research firm Public Insight and was CEO of Snowcap, a digital musical license company. And during the Clinton administration, he was the associate director and chief information officer at the U.S. Information Agency and later an advisor and spokesman for Vice President Al Gore. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, please welcome Christopher Schroeder and Jonathan Spalter. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Skip. Just a mic check, can everybody hear me? First of all, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon for what I hope is going to be a very exciting and probing discussion um, that will all actually catalyze and get us motivated to do great things, are, uh, great along the lines of what Chris has done in composing this book. If you go to Goodreads, there's a wonderful review um, about a young man who crossed an ocean. Um, both perplexed and intrigued about the potential and the possibilities that lay across the ocean in a society, in, in, in a, a, a range of societies actually, given the landmass, uh, and of peoples that really did see a better and brighter future for themselves and thus were organizing in innovative and important ways in laying down the infrastructure, the ecosystem, the cultural technological and political habits to drive towards that new future. You all think I'm talking about Chris Schroeder's book. I'm not. No. I'm talking about uh, a young man named Alexis de Tocqueville who wrote a book called Democracy in America. And I don't think it's, uh, maybe I will be uh, slapped on so side the head by Chris by making a comparison between yes. his book yeah. and Democracy in America. But I do think I want to sort of set the table in our conversation this afternoon by offering that comparison for your reflection. Democracy in America was an important analysis of a, of a society, actually a number of societies, because what de Tocqueville looked at wasn't simply the colonial settlers there, but all aspects of our social fabric in the 18th century and saw a tremendous amount of innovation going on, innovation that hadn't been explored before, as Chris describes this kind of innovation, what he calls the unobvious. And he, in both a sense of a travelogue, uh, a cultural, geographic, and economic uh, analysis, 
gave both form and meaning and also a sense of structure to all of these amazing things that have been going on in our own society. And I believe, after, actually, after having read carefully Chris's work, understanding the inspiration that went into your work, um, and also, importantly, seeing the impact that Chris's book has brought, not only to reading publics here in the United States, but as importantly to the communities of men and women that you were writing about in the Middle East, that that same kind of spark that was elaborated by de Tocqueville in 1831, I think, is present and palpable in what Chris has done in his work, Startup Rising. You know, there's a phrase that he writes in his book, and I encourage all of you to buy one if you haven't read it yet, which is called WAMDA, which again is that spark. And there, I would like to really delve deeply with Chris into what actually was not only the spark that's illuminating so much of this change that we're seeing technologically and in terms of entrepreneurial fervor in the Middle East, but also the spark that led him to this analysis, why it's important. Um, the, the same spark, the same lambda that he brings to so much of his career and his life, I'd like to start by letting you all know that all of the proceeds for Chris's work is going to a, an important initiative in Amman, based in a refugee camp there, and he'll <coughs> talk a little more about it, called Ruad. Um, that is not at all unlike Chris, his temperament, his gentlemanliness, his deeply public spirit. I've got to know Chris, um, I can't say how many years ago. It's been a while. But we were both in Washington. He was uh, leading the effort to build a digital platform for the Washington Post. I happened to be working at the White House at the time. We instantly connected in, actually not in Washington at all, but in France. Um, we stayed friends, and except for the bad luck of both the geography and time, we have never really lived in the same place since. Um, it's a delight to be with you, Chris, and to have watched the progress of your career, not only from the Washington Post and leading its entrepreneurial vision for its digital future, but taking that entrepreneurial spirit and bringing it to a very important platform that we all now in the United States and increasingly globally are accessing, which is the connectivity between the internet and internet-based communications and our health and well-being. He built and led a company called Health Central, which was recently sold. I think that gave you some time and space to be reflective about what was important in the world. And it was in a trip that he was invited to, to participate uh, in Dubai at a conference called the Celebration of Entrepreneurship that was led by two of his colleagues that he got to know in the Young Presidents Organization subgroup that you were working with, that he got on the plane and went to Dubai. And there is where the story begins. Yeah. It was at that conference, the celebration of entrepreneurship, that Chris, um, who was a very incisive thinker, saw in many respects the future. He wrote, personally, I will look at the modern history of the Middle East as beginning at that conference in Dubai. So Chris, take us there. Yeah. You're, you're, you get to the conference, you're off the plane, you don't know what to expect, something happens. So firstly, it's wonderful to be with you again. It's like no time pass, and uh, your career and what you've done is amazing. And I do want to thank you all for being here and for the Milken folks and Skip and his team for doing this, because this is not an obvious story. right? We have one narrative about the Middle East right now, and the United States in particular, and that narrative is, is about the war and sectarian violence. And it's a very, very real narrative. There's nothing that I'm about to say that suggests that this is not equally real. But in it, I think, like so often with any narrative bias, we get locked into a certain narrative and we don't have an ability to see how the next five years can be different than the last five years. And in a way, that's the journey of my book and the journey that I went to that conference in Dubai that you asked me for. Because I've been all over the world. I've been in the Middle East as a tourist. I have outsourced technology uh, in the companies that I've run from South America to Eastern Europe to Sri Lanka to India to Israel. I know firsthand what happens to societies when they have broad access to technology and what that can mean for those societies. And yet I could not get it through my mind that in those days Mubarak's Egypt could be kicking this up, even though, of course, just a few miles away in Israel was one of the greatest tech ecosystems, arguably, in the world, second maybe to Silicon Valley. But the, the idea that that was happening elsewhere, I just couldn't get my mind around. 
And as you described, I got invited by these two remarkable men. Fatty Gondor was an entrepreneur in his own right when there were not really used that word in the Middle East. He built a company called Aramex, which is the FedEx in the, of the Middle East and uh, Africa. And Arif Nakvi, who is the head of Abraj Capital, which is now the largest private equity firm in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. They were talking about to me for years about what young people were doing, and they put their money where their mouth was to hold this gathering and dragged me there. And I arrived in Dubai, for the, you who've been there know that it's imminently comfortable to any Westerner. It's like walking into Las Vegas almost in a way. Very, very modern. It had been a desert 15 years previous to that. And I was not prepared to see 2,400 young people from North Africa to Yemen uh, with a waiting list of another 24 or 3,000, 2,400 or 3,000 people none of whom wanted to talk politics. None of them cared about President Obama's Cairo speech. All they wanted to talk about from 8 in the morning until midnight was how to build their companies and how they could do problem solving with the innovation that was in their hands right there. And it, it just hit me like a two by four, both in terms of the power and consistency of it, but also as a check to my own narrative bias. Because literally the biggest reaction I had was, well, of course, I've seen this everywhere. Why would it be any different once there's a ubiquitous access to technology? And that was amazing. Well, let's start a little bit about trying to understand the fog or the clouds through which we actually have been viewing the Middle East. You wrote in your book, Chris, uh, the, the, you referenced actually a Gallup poll survey that showed that even today there is an abominably poor understanding of the context, the reality of life in the Middle East. And that is a contributor to a perception of Middle East society, Middle East culture as significantly negative compared to our outlook on a number of other countries and cultures in the world. Yeah. As an American, you're at this conference, you, you've spent a lot of time thinking about living with, working with, interpreting the realities that are on the ground. Step back and try to explain what has contributed to this poor conception or this misconception. Of well, the I, I really do think it's a, it's uh, it's a misconception and a narrative bias, like most misconceptions and narrative bias that have some basis in fact, right? I mean, our psyche in this country has been definitely formed by September 11th in very profound ways, and, and it has therefore become our interpretation of an entire region, an entire people, uh, an entire faith. And I'm not justifying that one way or the other, but it certainly is, you know, the way or a foundation of a narrative bias can begin. But then what happens is over a period of time, people stop, and particularly, you know, journalists and, and other folks who are not traveling to these regions, you end up just being confirmed in everything that you see. It fits into that narrative. Mm -hmm. And so things that don't fit in the narrative not only are not getting through, but if they do start to come, you actually reject them. It's a very human nature thing to do, which is if it really goes against, what was it, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the great theologian, said of orthodoxy, it's only when we are unsure that we are doubly sure. And, and I think that's a big part of what narrative bias is. And I I think that's been a big part of what our challenge has been up until this day here, and not just there. I mean, you know, I talk to friends about Africa. Africa is becoming a little bit in now to be talking about. Uh, many of you probably know that the largest mobile payment country on earth in aggregate dollars is Kenya. 20% of the entire GDP of Kenya passes through a dumb phone texting cash capability. And so stories like that start to get out, and then people think, well, maybe Africa is okay. But then they don't make any difference between Kenya and Mali because we think of Africa as one thing and it slowly, chit by chit, you know, mm -hmm. goes away. But there's not a lot of incentive for people to break their narrative on this for some reason, which surprises me since we've been so symbiotic attached to the Middle East for right. so long in our lifetime. But again, going back to that moment in Dubai, you're on the ground, it's 2010, three years ago. You have an epiphany of understanding that there is this potential and possibility <laughs> in, in, a, in a realm that we have not seen potentially as policymakers, as entrepreneurs, as investors in our country. Take us through the story then. What happens? Well, I'll tell you, there's one quick moment that I had that I describe in the book at the conference, and it helped me uh, extend my trip because we had these uh, mentoring sessions. So mm -hmm. It was an unconference. It were big gatherings, but it was a lot of small gatherings. And then they would break out us entrepreneurs who had built and succeeded and failed to come talk to young people. And you get in a room with five or six or seven young folks. And um, they would ask questions, and they were very impressive. I can remember this remarkable young man from Syria uh, who had a beautiful artistic sense, building a 3D animation capability uh, that was just phenomenal. And you know, it was just one after another like this. And while I'm talking, it, to my left, passing almost like a, like a cloud, was a black imagery. But I was focused over here. And when I turned around, sitting right at the edge of her chair with her shoulders back, 
right up looking at me, closer than you're sitting to me now, was a young woman in a full abaya. Mm -hmm. And she went to say to me, look, I've built this business. I'm a young student in Saudi Arabia. I've built this capability where you can solar charge uh, cases so that women who are going around Saudi Arabia can always have their cell phones charged, but it's made for women in ways that, one, they're elegant, and secondly, you can also put papers and live your day-to-day -day life, and I really wonder what you think. Completely out of my narrative. So I trip on myself, effectively, and say some ridiculous answer, like, oh, follow your dream. I mean, <laughs> And you, you, could, you could watch her just sort of patiently gritting her teeth, and she said, well, thank you. That's very nice. I appreciate that. She said, but I have a very specific question. I've priced this now with three different manufacturers in China. They all have different prices and different things that they're looking at right now, and it's very important to me. But on the other hand, I'm not sure they understand our quality. So I know that it costs $45,000 to buy a machine tool, which I know which I can buy right now in Egypt. I can hire two young women in my backyard to do that. I'm not sure it'll be as efficient as going to China, but I really think at the end of the day I can manage my quality. What do you think? <laughs> to which I looked at her as other people were smiling next to me, and I said, well, I have a problem in my business I'd like to ask you about first, mm -hmm. because I think you may be able to do that. And, and it was just one after another. I extended that trip, not expectedly. I went to Cairo, and I went to Amman, and I just saw these young people over and over again. And the discussions were like that discussion. And then a book, an idea for a book happened. So um, it has been throughout my, I'm not a, a, a writer, I'm a poser, but for a businessman, I can push a noun and a verb together decently, I suppose. And all my life, to clear the BS in my head, I've always written like 750 word columns, that mm -hmm. kind of a thing. It, it's a way just to get it out and to see whether or not the thesis I'm having does make some sense. I mean, you can lie in paper, but it's not as easy as what rumbles around in your head. So when I went on this trip, on the trip back, apropos really of nothing except that, I wrote an op-ed about what I had seen. And since I'd run the stuff with the Washington Post and Newsweek online, uh, I gave it to the editor there. And two days later, he called me back, and he said, no way. And I said, look, Fred, I'm not an expert in the Middle East, but I am a pretty hard nose when it comes to this kind of technology stuff, and I'm just telling you what I saw. Mm -hmm. And two days after that, he said, okay, I'll take it if you still have it. And that changed everything, because what ended up happening was that I got inundated by emails by Americans, fundamentally to a person, said, really? And then I got, and this is not an exaggeration, I don't know how they found my email, I got 350 plus emails from the region of people who simply wrote in some version, thank you for telling the other story of the Middle East. And from that I got invited back, because if you write in the Washington mm -hmm. Post they think you're an expert. So I got invited back to be judges at startup competitions, and every time I went, friends of mine in the journalism world or the blogging world said, hey, we're never going to cover this. Mm -hmm. If you want to knock out 750 words, that would be great. And I did, I don't know, six, seven, eight pieces. And just about the time that we sold my last company, a marvelous agent started talking to me. We were introduced by friends, and she said, this is a book if you want to make it one. And I just made the decision I was going to take a year off after that and really opened my mind to what was happening. And one of the benefits of your being able to have the time and space to commit to this project Huge. was that you were able actually to approach the subject not from a rose-tinted perspective, but to really get a clear-eyed view on the ground of not only the potential that entrepreneurialism is and can bring to the Middle East, but you also saw where the systemic and structural barriers have been in place, um, how severe they have been, and I recall reading your book, you gave this wonderful sort of assessment from, a, from the Middle East cultural perspective, and I know that there, that encompasses so many different cultural perspectives, but the concept of wafta, Wasta. Wasta. Yeah. Wasta. Yeah. T talk to us about wasta as a metaphor for how difficult it, is, it has been, and potentially continues to be, for this new entrepreneurial class in the Middle East to actually succeed. So you're asking a very central question, which when I talk to my friends in Silicon Valley in particular, have such doubt about, because infrastructure matters, ecosystem, the buzzword of the day, matters. What has been so shocking to me, not just in the Middle East, but in other emerging markets, is with technology, how much ecosystem is being built bottom up. Mm -hmm. They're not waiting for universities to come around. They're not waiting for lower education to come around. They're not waiting for government to clear out regulations. They're literally building and solving problems through software just to do it. They're connecting and teaching each other basics of programming just to do it. And it's very exciting, and it's very provocative. And at the same time, though, I would not go so far to say that the top-down doesn't matter. And the infrastructure there is challenging, government corruption is challenging, rule of law is challenging, obviously the political instability is supremely challenging, mm -hmm. and they're all there, I think, in parallel. But the one that you asked about is a, a cultural phenomenon, which coming from Washington, I should know what this word meant, <laughs> but I did not know it until I got there, and the word was wasta. And wasta is actually mostly a Lebanese word, but everyone in the region knows it, 
which is effectively who do you know? So hence Washington is WASTA. But, but it's actually, it's, it's not, there's nothing funny about it, right? Because when you stop to think about the cancer that is WASTA, if you work very hard in school and you go to a good school and you want to get a good job, it will come maybe because of WASTA. Mm -hmm. Once you get into that organization, you may have somebody above you who is terrible and you'll never get around them because he or she may be protected by WASTA. So it is a huge phenomenon. One of my favorite lines in the entire book actually came from Fadi Gondor, who um, said to me early on, he realized that there is no WASTA on the internet. And he was saying an incredibly provocative, forward-looking, profound thing. He meant, I think, two things by it. One, so many of these startups that had been rising in the Middle East and elsewhere, again, are happening despite the ecosystem. They're moving around it. They're not waiting for anybody to do anything. They're just moving. And candidly, most of these young people understand technology can use it much more faster, much faster than the top-down traditional institutions that, that stand in their way. And so it means just moving around it and moving quickly. But the second thing they meant by it is that the Internet, obviously, is all about transparency. So a year ago, almost to the day, LinkedIn opened up offices in the Arab world, mm -hmm. first time. Except that when they arrived, there were already 6 million Arabs registered on LinkedIn. And as the head of LinkedIn Middle East said to me, there's no WASD on LinkedIn. This is who you are. This is your record. This is who reviews you. Here's your letter of recommendations. This is who you are. There is no WASD here. Mm -hmm. And so, again, while it's there and it's profound and it can be uh, totally stiltifying, there's something else happening around that people can both work around it and adjust it in a different way. That's really interesting on the cultural side. I think it would be useful if we actually take each of the structural or systemic impediments, try to understand them a little bit about what is confronting the entrepreneurial class yeah. and spirit in the Middle East as a way of really then going to the next part of what I want to talk to you about, which is the fire starters, some of the folks that you met and got to know and exciting things that they've been doing despite these systemic problems. So moving from the cultural to the economic, we know that there still is this very sad legacy of deep structural employment. You mentioned uh, educational challenges. Yeah. Um, the illiteracy has been cut in half in the last decade. There still is lingering challenges for educational systems and infrastructure, including education for women. Um, we know that there is, um, uh, in many societies, uh, the idea of open, transparent forms of information flow, of the so-called open source society that we've become much more used to in wonderful places like this, literally, Silicon yeah. Beach, where we're, we're, we're sitting, where I'm from, Silicon Valley. A, a number of structural challenges. Why don't you walk through each a little bit and give us a sense of just how high these, these mountains are. For they're high. Of these I mean, let, let, let there be no doubt that they're high. I mean, I'll give you one example from rule, rule of Law, and then I'll talk about education because, in a way, it pivots to some of the most interesting fire starters, in a way. But um, e commerce is an enormous opportunity, I believe, in the Arab world. I mean, people forget, people will argue that the Arab world is not really a market. Well, it's closer to being a market than, say, Brazil is to the rest of Latin America, I would argue, overall. I mean, at least, if nothing else, there's a shared language. 350 million plus people per capita income, larger uh, than India and China, and um, you know buyers, shoppers, right? And there was some wealth, obviously desperate, but it's there. And to put it in perspective, e-commerce is probably a billion to billion and a half a year business now, right now, and a regular movement of goods in the region is probably about 450 million. Okay, there's a huge gap to be filled and opportunity that we'd see there. But every country has its own regulations, its own people checking your bags and whatever you're shipping at any given time, fees and so on. So imagine if Jeff Bezos tried to build Amazon with 50 states, with 50 regulatory bodies, many, much of the time you wouldn't know where it is. So it's a problem. I mean, that's, a, that's an issue. Now, there's some uh, methods to go about trying to unify some of the code, particularly in the Gulf countries, the GCC, mm -hmm. which now, as you know, includes Morocco and Jordan. Um, Aramex and other major logistics companies are coming in and just saying to young entrepreneurs, I'll deal with that stuff. Your goods will be there a couple of days later than they would be otherwise, but don't you worry about it. We'll figure that part out. Let's just get you moving and that kind of thing. So that's encouraging, but it's real. Education, for me, was a mind blow, right? Because among other things I learned, and, and forgive me in this case for using the Arab world in an aggregate sense, because this does, there is some variance country by country, but for the purposes, just go with me on this, which is on a per capita basis, the amount of money spent in education there is actually higher than some parts of Southeast Asia, not China, but others. And... For that money, what do you get? Uh, the illiteracy rate that you just talked about before, average public school classroom sizes of 70 kids, breathtaking rote learning to being taught to a test, 
And most of the rote learning is about history and skills that have nothing to do with the 21st century. So, I mean, this is a very big problem. I can illustrate it in dollars to give you a sense of it, which I think tells you a lot in this anecdote, which is that in, I think it's Cairo alone, the ancillary um, uh, tutoring industry offline is somewhere between two and three billion dollars hmm. a year. So what does that tell you? It tells you education is not good, mm -hmm. and it tells you that the rich are taking care of themselves. Enter now the possibilities through dumb phones and smartphones. And remember, dumb phone penetration in most countries in the Middle East are over 100 percent, meaning that, that, that you know, income may be a few dollars a day or whatever, but they have more than one phone. Dumb phones through smartphones through computing, people are now beginning to innovate amazing ideas to help supplement education, mm -hmm. where not only do the rich pay a lot of money to get it, but anybody who's got one of these is able to supplement their education. And that kind of stuff, I think, becomes very interesting because that's a tool available that was not available five years ago. And no one there, no one at least the young generation, believes that the government is going to fix the public school education system in and of itself. Something else has to come. A corollary to education is, in fact, language. Yes. You wrote, you, you wrote in your book a really interesting point that though 80% of the 350 million Middle Eastern Arabic citizens speak Arabic, Arabic only, yeah. only 1% of the global content that exists in the Internet is in, in Arabic. Arabic. Yeah. Huge impediment. And huge opportunity. No, no surprise it. that so many of the startups that you're seeing now are either content media companies in some form, who are literally, like, you know, there's all these wonderful women who are building effectively the little Einsteins of the Arabic world, right? You know, kids content, uh, both in television and available online. Uh, there's an amazing company called Karabish, which is doing uh, primarily YouTube distribution and other video content that's very funny, parodies, uh, John Stewart-esque, but much more than that, uh, which is very clever and very scalable. There's an amazing woman named May Habib, um, who has uh, built a platform to effectively outsource businesses and now consumers wanting to translate content easily and effectively by using this platform to employ literally thousands of women around the region to help who pass a test for her, but then translate going forward. So it's a challenge, but it is, it's one of the most interesting and obvious opportunities. The, uh, I'd like to also get your perspectives on the religious aspects of cultural dimension and the, both the opportunities and the challenges that plays for entrepreneurs. But I was also struck, Chris, by um, in your delineation of the challenges that are being met and actually uh, surpassed by many younger entrepreneurs in the Middle East that, and despite the misconceptions that many Americans still bring to that broad region, that there are enormous <coughs> points of alignment and by the way, this is probably one of the few audiences we will be in where we say, you know, please, as a courtesy to your neighbor, don't turn off your mobile phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, with two techies here. Um, you, you wrote a lot about the, the actual similarities that exist uh, culturally in terms of economic principles between the United States and the Middle East. And I thought they were really eye-opening, one of which I'd like to share with the audience. Um, a, a friend of yours, Ahmad Alfi, um, you wrote uh, when you were speaking about um, the, his perception of American culture. You wrote, uh, he looked almost wistful in his answer. Throughout my entire life, it has been clear to me that Islam at its essence and America are perfect together. Every core ideal, Americans value individualism, individual accountability, calling out lying, cheating, stealing, are all there. Reflect on that. So I wrote a chapter in the book about religion and the ecosystem. And I was advised by both Americans and some in the region, but not many. Most really cheered me on on this, not to go there. And I made a decision to go there because I realized that wherever I travel in the world and meet with entrepreneurs, and I have to tell you, Mike Moritz said this in the book, a great Silicon Valley venture capitalist, and I absolutely agree with it. Wherever you go in the world, when you're with great entrepreneurs, these women and men are the same people. They're the same people. I mean, it's problem solved same way, tenacity same way. I mean, it's all very same. So I'll go anywhere in the world and I'll come back and nobody ever asks me about religion, ever. Now, I can come back from Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country on earth. Nobody ever asked me about mm -hmm. Islam. No one asked me from Israel. Nobody certainly asked me about Hinduism from India. When I invest here as a venture capitalist, it never comes up. I cannot return 
from the Arab world without one of the first questions being about Islam and the ecosystem, which I think goes back to a lot of our narrative basis. On that alone, I thought it was important to explore this mm -hmm. and explore both our bias and to ask a very, very specific question of the entrepreneurs, which is, because I'm no theologian, right? I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic in an Italian-American home, which has its own psychosis, I can tell you. So I don't consider myself expert in anything. So. But what I wanted to do was not get into a long historical debate or dialogue, but to ask this question. One is, how is religion affecting your life as an entrepreneur, if at all? And also, if you're in a society, whether it's religion or something else, that demands either or lockstep adherence to hierarchy, you need to follow the hierarchy in order to succeed in your society, and or you put half of your population and talent at bay, obviously I'm talking about women, mm -hmm. how is that possibly going to be a globally competitive society going forward in the worlds we know on the internet? And it lit people up like firecrackers. And Ahmed Alfi, who's a great uh, venture capitalist, one of the first venture, really great venture capitalists in Egypt, uh, who spent 18 years in the United States investing here, so really was a, a perfect kind of uh, both ways, said the same thing that young entrepreneurs said to me in that chapter as well across the board, deeply uh, faithful to their religion, passionate about it. Um, believe very, very firmly in the individuality that it offers. The hierarchy had no place in religion and society in any kind of a way. And absolute conviction that if you put any of your talent at bay that you cannot convey. And what you got as people talked about it was really two things. One, that it was evidence to me in any event that that which allows people to open up discussion about politics, opens up discussion about their economic future, hence the entrepreneurs, opens up the ability to question the role of women's society, the role of faith in my life, to hold anything accountable. That to me was, I thought, very interesting. And then secondly, a lot of these entrepreneurs not only brought religion to their uh, way they ran their businesses, um, but they also were building businesses that were, would reach you know, very powerfully billion person market mm -hmm. in faith. And so that there was a whole slew of opportunity that was also being built uh, with the technology that could do interesting things there. You also suggest that where there are areas of compatibility between the cultural premises of Islam and the American culture, there are also significant correlations between the broader macro and microeconomic outlook on a principles basis in the Middle East, broadly speaking, and here in the United States. Give me an example. But they're fundamentally libertarian in perspective. Certainly the entrepreneurs and the ones that I, I were with were libertarian. Look, I remember, in a way, I'm in a bubble of sorts because I'm talking to entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. and, and these are not, I mean, they're, some of them are Western educated, some of them come from wealth, but a lot of them did not. It was really a wide spectrum. I had to translate some of the people I met with and all. But these are people who, by definition, have decided to seize technology and move things in their own way. And there, by definition, you, there isn't anybody, any great businesswoman or man I've been with in the States that would not feel utterly simpatico with the way that they're viewing, what they're building, why they're viewing, what its ramifications are, both for them personally and on their societies more broadly. Right? You touched on before the youth bubble in the region. I mean, many of these countries in the Arab world have uh, populations of greater than 50% under the age, pick your number, 35, 28, whatever it is huge amount of young people. They all know, and I absolutely agree, that at one level that's an opportunity, right? In some respects, I'd rather have that problem than Japan's problem mm -hmm. with an aging population and all. On the other hand, if half your population of that age bracket isn't finding a job, which is a big problem, then we know what that looks like as well. The entrepreneurs say, therefore, more and more people are going to step up and create their economic futures. I did not talk to a single economist, a single professor, a single government official there or here who could explain to me how traditional business and traditional government practices were going to do anything constructively measurably for that youth bubble. But in this entrepreneurship, both tech-enabled and tech-focused, there is something here uh, which we have to look at, I think, very hard. Is it, is it mere propinquity or is there actually a causal relationship between the fact that there was this political revolution if you want to use the word revolution, that was coinciding with so much of the sparks that you were witnessing and documenting in terms of the economic and technological renaissance that was going on in society. Yeah, it's a question I get most often, which is, was this all a, an, up, an outshoot of the Arab Spring or Arab uprisings, what have you? And, and the question, once I was there, confused me no end. Because to me, it's all part and parcel of the same. There's no chronology here. If you have the capability to see the way the rest of the world lives, if you have the ability mm -hmm. to communicate with anyone you want at any time, if you can collaborate to solve problems very cost-effectively, 
if, I mean, stop and think about this for a second. I mean, really, this is a mind blow. It, it almost sounds like a cliche, it's such a mind blow, but it really is what we're going to be talking about over the next eight to 10 years. If all of a sudden you have essentially all of the world's knowledge at your fingertips essentially for free, you want a political voice, you want to be able to debate sacred cows of your, to mix metaphors to, of your society, your culture, and so on, you absolutely want to have a debate about what economic future you want. The word that drove so many young people crazy, that was a word of their parents, which was stable, stability. Because so much was justified in the Mubarak era and others in the name of stability. And the young entrepreneurs would say to me regularly, says, look, we understand stableness. We're business people. We get that there is a value in having some sense of predictability and not having things go wrong and everything else. But the word drives us crazy because it was always an excuse to go along. And why our parents wanted for us what they had, we do not understand. And I must have heard that uh, hundreds of times in some form. So you're making multiple trips to the Middle East now. You're deep in research. Yeah. You're being able to actually not only see, but engage and befriend yeah. what I call the fire starters. I think it would be really interesting to share some stories about these women and men that you met. Um, who are they? What were some of the most profound, game-changing innovations that they were deploying, or ideas that they were sharing with you? And I, I, there was, your, your book has got so many examples, but I'd love to just start with a few names. Uh, and and, and where, where these folks are now, since yeah. you've actually published your book. Um, for example, May Habib. Yeah. T t tell us a little bit about May. So May, I mentioned before, she was one with the great, she was from Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, really came from effectively nothing, though she was able to get to Harvard. Uh, she was Western educated uh, and went back. An extraordinary story of building this platform to uh, do translation and other services and growing rapidly. A story that I couldn't tell at the time and I have to tell gingerly now was that a chunk of her engineers were Syrian and during the worst of the fighting, they were in Syria and yet they never missed a quarterly meeting. They just, they appeared. They just appeared. Electricity would go down, they found electricity somewhere else. Broadband would go down, they found it somewhere else. And eventually they had to, they did have to move. But, um, you know, she just doesn't give in. I mean, she's a great, fantastic entrepreneur. And her company is, uh, it must be three times the size of when I wrote it. She's doing great. Hind uh, Hobeka. Hind is, um, uh, was a great college swimmer in Beirut. And it drove her crazy that when she trained, that just to do some basic measurements of the heart rate and breathing, most of the devices they had were adapted from runners, so they'd be waterproof or whatever, but they'd be like here. So how do you do this? <laughs> Look at that, this is crazy. So she developed a goggle, very lightweight, that would measure pulse and breath through uh, your temple effectively. And it's a Google Glass-like experience. You can look up in the glass and see how you're doing at any given time. She's outsourced manufacturing to Asia. She has built business development relationships to launch in the West, I think, later this year, maybe early in January. Uh, it's a fantastic story. And what I love is that she did, raised a fair amount of capital early on uh, in an angel round. And she was, needed a little bit more money, but not a lot, just to get over the hump. Mm -hmm. And she was afraid to negotiate. She wanted to negotiate from a position of strength. So what do young people do? She went to Indiegogo, which is one of the crowdfunding places where you could, if you give a little bit of a donation, you could get some of the goggles first. Mm -hmm. She wanted to raise something, you know, small, like $35,000 just to help get over a marketing thing that she was looking to do, and that would be fine. Give away no equity, obviously. And within two weeks, she'd raised 85000 you know, from the crowds. So it's a, she's wonderful. That's extraordinary. Another wonderful story, your encounter with the team in Alexandria, Egypt, that yeah. deployed the, one of the, the mo one or two largest weather sites. Yeah. So oh these guys were just, this, this, his name is uh, um, uh, Ramadan, uh, Amir Ramadan, and uh, from uh, Alexandria, Egypt. Anyways, he pitched me at a startup competition in Egypt mm -hmm. that I went to after the celebration of entrepreneurship. And you just, you just know, you would know this from your Silicon Valley stuff and I, from my investing, you knew that, that either you're going to invest in this guy now or you'd invest in his next company. He's just right. going to figure it out. I remember him, I asked him how much he founded his company with and he said the the um, Cairo equivalent of $1,000, $1,060. I'm like, any entrepreneur who knows the difference between 1000 bucks and 1060. 1060 is watching every dollar like it's his own. Mm -hmm. Very creative, very innovative, works very hard, marvelous. So we began to describe this weather app that's now called Clear Day, and it's a beautiful 3D experience. And I looked down on my iPad, and I realized I had downloaded it six months earlier, not knowing that it was 30 young people from Alexandria, Egypt. Now, I believe he's 75 people in Egypt. Clear Day, which then was a big deal at 400,000 downloads at 95 cents a pop is a lot of money to them. 
uh, I think has something like 7 million downloads now. 40 some percent of them are from the United States. And are they still resilient despite the political turmoil? Don't stop. They're fantastic. Do not stop. Another interesting story, very moving story, Chris. 18 days in Egypt. Yeah, so this amazing woman um, is a videographer and an artist in that. And she began to realize, 18 days, of course, uh, refers to the time from the beginning of, um, of uh, Tahrir Square and when Mubarak fell. And she built a platform that aggregated videos from people who were documenting what was happening and built what was the first crowd-sourced documentary of any moment in history. And 18 Days is just like, stunning. You can go to the website still and, and go see what she created. And now she's working on another platform that's a little bit like Storify or these other storytelling platforms where she can take this collaborative ideas of how they use technology both to communicate and to record what was going on to make some really interesting uh, storytelling. The other really interesting um, motif that you wrote about was the collectivity of effort. Let me explain. I was really struck by the number of incubators that you ran across, some of which you're now personally involved in championing. Uh, WAMDA, Flat Six Labs, Oasis 500 yeah. in Jordan. Um, these are um, incubators, like Y Combinator. Yep. Um, and they're uh, metastasizing in very great ways. They are. Tell us a little bit about what you met, what they've been doing, and why they are particularly in these environments important. So if you went to any of these incubators or accelerators that have been springing up, you'd feel like you were in Silicon Valley or New York or anywhere else. Beautiful, modern, open, shared uh, workspaces. Uh, broadband works beautifully. Uh, there are lots of proactive activities to have them combine and talk and share learning and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They'd have these mentoring sessions and all the WAMDA people, particularly, which is mostly an online platform. They, they support a lot of offline efforts, like they have this thing called Mix and Mentor, where they'll bring you know old guys like me around, but from the region, or they'll bring me in if I'm around to sit with young people and you know have conversations in, in small settings. But I can tell you, I mean, this is anecdotal, but it just tells you a lot of what's happening there. I went to one of the first Mix and Mentor events where. A lot of the young people wanted to drill me with having questions. And then I went to one just a few months ago, and it must have been 400, 500 people broken in small groups. And uh, I sat there, and it'd be, within five minutes, I realized I was utterly irrelevant to the conversation because everyone at the table was talking to themselves. They were sharing their own stories. It didn't, I mean, you know, my perspective was sometimes moderately amusing to them, but mostly it was a sort of rising of shared learning and expertise. And the reason why that is so important is because of what we touched on earlier about education. This is a bottom-up phenomenon, right. right? I mean, there are A engineers, tech engineers there, but there are an awful lot of Cs. How do Cs become As? What are Bs? How can you find these people and all? There's not a good system in place to do it. So these accelerators and incubators and gatherings like ArabNet and WAMDA are going way out of their way to not only find the best talent so we can find the best companies to work for, but also that there can be shared learning and bring the, bring the average up. The, um, we spoke about the connectivity or the, the, the opportunities that might exist in particularly parts of the Middle East where Islamic culture is profoundly important. And there's a huge diversity in that concept. But in those areas where, there, where Islam is preponderant and predominant and important, um, there have even been sparks of innovation leveraging Islam as a yeah. way of creating business models. One of them I thought was really interesting you pointed to was Anna Basali. Talk to us about Anna Basali. Yeah, so Anna Basali was, uh, was effectively an app to remind uh, people when to pray. I mean, it's sort of a very commonsensical thing that I think is very powerful. There's an amazing company that was built by an Egyptian who spent a lot of time <coughs> in Silicon Valley, and the company sort of spread between the two uh, called Ideal Ratings which actually rates publicly traded companies on whether they're adherent to Islamic law. Mm -hmm. But it actually passes no judgment for the most part. It literally just will assess the balance sheet and the income statement and the things that they do and describe, I'm making this up, but how much pork is in uh, McDonald's. And then you, the investor, in a bottom-up kind of way, can make a decision whether or not you feel that that's in alignment or not. Very big business. Standard and poor's for value. Yeah, exactly. Really interesting. Yeah. And how are these integrated into daily practice uh, amongst uh, normal citizens or consumers? I think, you know, I mean, wh where people have the devices, they have access. If you have a browser, you have access, just like anywhere else. Mm -hmm. the, the other interesting point would be quite, quite important to gain your perspective. So you've been spending time in these incubators. You've been spending time in these companies. 
um, the changing role of women in these societies is we know there, there is foment and ferment in yeah. that as well. But how is that change being articulated in the companies and the communities that you've been spending time in? So the economists, I mean, I don't think the data is great now, but, but the economists reported this summer that a third of the tech startups are tech enabled, right? Sometimes when I use the word tech startups, people think Silicon Valley, highfalutin stuff. But think of it as tech enabled, right? I mean, mm -hmm. literally women who are actually crafts business people who are either using a cell phone or using a platform to sell their crafts. They're not necessarily doing PhD work. It's just the idea that technology becomes so diffuse that you can do unbelievably innovative things with it, but also just make your day-to-day -day stuff better. So with that as an understanding, they said a third of the tech entrepreneurs are women. Hmm. I can tell you that anecdotally, every event I went to easily was that or more. I was a judge at the startup competition in Beirut that was done by this uh, local group based on MIT. MIT has uh, forums around the world. This was the Arab Forum of MIT. Amazing woman, Hala Fadel, who's put on these startup competitions. Two years ago, it was, as I described before, five, 6,000 entrepreneurial companies, 14, 15,000 entrepreneurs, 41% were women. And it was very interesting when I interviewed women, I sort of effectively said, what's up? Right? Mm -hmm. This is clearly out of the gringo narrative. Right. And I got, you know, I get for every woman who's building a company, you get a different story about their company, which was very moving. But if I had to bucket them, there were two very distinct reactions I heard repeatedly. The first were women entrepreneurs who they would get up in my grid. I mean, they were like, I am not a woman entrepreneur. Do not put me in your woman chapter. You gringos obsess on this subject. It's ridiculous. I'm an entrepreneur. I've built a great company. I'm happy to talk to you about my company. Don't talk to me in any kind of different way. Mm -hmm. Another group would say, look, let's be real. I'm an e-commerce maker. Saudi Arabia is one of the big markets for us in order to succeed, and I can't drive when I go there. Right. Lots of women, when they would talk, would say things would be familiar to women everywhere, like my husband's a pain in the neck. I have to balance the kids while I'm doing this, but I really don't care. And, and you'd get these kind of debates across the spectrum. You had a lot of women who were very concerned about how male venture capitalists could be patronizing or worse. I mean, you get the whole spectrum of the stuff that we would be familiar with. But the other thing which they said to a woman in some form, and I probably interviewed 50 in, for the book, they said, look, what's the definition of a great entrepreneur? The definition of a great entrepreneur is working around stuff. Who's better than working around stuff than I am? I've spent my life working around it. Mm -hmm. Well said. At the governmental level, yeah. do you, are you optimistic that, um, no. well, Share your pessimism. <laughs> no, and, and let, me, let me just elaborate a little bit. At, at, at the governmental level, and by the way, I was not necessarily reflecting on our government. The answer is the same. But <laughs> as policy frameworks, as government officials are beginning to wake up and understand that there's a greater diversity of not only involvement and engagement that will have both potential economic benefits, but also cultural and or political disbenefits in yes. terms of civic engagement, in terms of the importation or the creation of new values. How do you see governments beginning to think this through now that the genie, in, in a sense, is out of the bottle? I'm not sure that governments fully appreciate not only the genie's out of the bottle, but to what the nature of the genie is. So mm -hmm. let me talk about the region first, and I can talk about our own government in this yeah. way. Um, like everything in life, there are exceptions. Like, you know, the King of Jordan actually has been very supportive of the uh, information communication technology yeah. sector for many years. And, and is uh, very favored by, I think, a lot of these communities here, and I think understands it in a very profound way. On the other hand, Jordan also passed a very vague um, press security, media security law, where you can't tell whether or not, not only is that law potentially cracking down on someone who creates a content company who says something that the regime doesn't want it to say, but if someone posts something on an e-commerce site, a review of a product, Maybe that could be there. The vagueness of that law in and of itself was very chilling among the young people who I think, frankly, expected more from the country. But net-net, I think they've been pretty interesting. Some of the Emirates and the Dubai in particular, I think, are very interesting. And some of the others are beginning to look at this and all. But I think, Jonathan, we really are in the midst of an incredible historic moment now. I mean, you, when you're in it, you don't know it. But I think this is bigger than any. You and I have shared many. We all in this room have shared profound historic moments over the last decades. But it is a battle between the 20th and the 21st century. It is a battle between the opportunity that is offered to us by the bottom up, by institutions that have been structured to be unbelievably top down. And if you're top down, there's a wonderful line a woman said to me in the book that hit me like a two by four. And it seems obvious, but it really hit me. Where she said, you know, top down, in a top down world, governments and big institutions think of people as problems. 
they're going to come at me politically, they're driving me crazy on this kind of thing, they're poor, I got to fix it somehow, I, them. But in bottom-up perspective, people are assets, meaning who knows better what they need than they do? Mm -hmm. Who has more interest in getting things right than they do? And I think that there's tremendous difficulty globally with government institutions by the way that they were structured, which was from the Cold War days, highly hierarchical and top-down, with the willingness to accept that this cannot go back, with a confusion that this is all about, quote-unquote, freedom of speech and political control, when in fact what this is also about is the economic platform of the future. In other words, and I don't even think China can do this forever, it's one thing for China to take a car moving 150 miles an hour and maybe try to get it at 120 miles an hour and say, that will work. Mm -hmm. It's another thing if a car is moving 20 miles an hour and you keep it at 10. Then you say to yourself, how does it ever catch up? And I think that's the challenge in a lot of these really, really emerging markets that the Middle East would be an example of it. On our side of the ledger, on the ground and in the bowels of government bureaucracies, there are heroes who get the bottom-up phenomenon and are helpful. The USID had these amazing consultants in Egypt that are deeply admired by the entrepreneurs on the ground. When let us just say this is not the high point of the general perception of the America on the ground. Uh, there is a program in the State Department called the Global Entrepreneurship Program that was started by a guy named Steve Coltai and, and then Sherry Porges and another woman now just stepped in to do it. And they really do some interesting stuff, but they have no budget. Right. Right. I could tell you about a great Egyptian entrepreneur who got invited to Silicon Valley last April to pitch his business, but he had to be there physically by June. They were not going to do this by Skype. And he was competing against other American companies with similar ideas. Got to get here by June, and you'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these other people. The best one will win. They went down to our embassy to get a visa, and they said, come back in August, and we'll interview you. Right. No, it's, and the stories like that are, are, are manifold. In fact, just today, I sent a, an email to our ambassador in Korea, asking I'm on a board of a Silicon Valley company that's desperate to get this Korean entrepreneur to come to the United States for six months to the year, to a year so he can actually learn about uh, the company's operations, its, its technology, its sales uh, strategy, so that he can return to Korea yeah. to be able to launch this very powerful and exciting sustainability technology in Korea. And guess what? His visa was denied. And so it's, uh, it's important that we put a mirror to our own practices. On the positive side of the ledger, though, in the last several years, you mentioned some of the programs at the State Department. It has been, I think, an historic shift uh, to its great credit that the Obama administration has put the concept of internet freedom as one of its key tenets of um, the foreign policy vision for the United States of America. NSA, NSA. Well, there's, NSA. There's, there, are downs there are downsides, but the fact that it has been articulated and that uh, both Secretary Clinton I, 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 and I don't Secretary mean to cut Charter, you off, Jonathan, but honestly, I, I wish some of these politicians would just stop talking about it, right? Because the other thing the Obama administration has done very well, and I'm not saying this in a partisan way, because the Republicans are worse on this mm -hmm. issue, in my view, is they'll give these amazing speeches about the importance of entrepreneurship. Right. But at the end of the day, if, if that young man I described can't get a visa, stop talking about no, it. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. But the, the message, though, that has been sent about the concept of the principle of Internet freedom, is it being heard? Is it being registered? Is it being elaborated? It's a wonderful question, and I don't have a great answer to it overall. I mean, you'd think that there might be huge opportunities in a lot of these emerging markets um, with, a, with new sources of uh, energy and so on to be able to be great hubs of data and all. And, um, you know, I think that right now these societies are nascent enough to get some of the basic things going um, that, that everything is upside. And they know full well that regimes will crack down and that privacy is not irrelevant. Um, credit card usage online is incredibly low because of a, a not a comfort level in using transactions right. online in that level, for example. Um, so whether or not our statements uh, are a beacon to elsewhere, I think time will have to play out. You, know, you, you mentioned the, um, the transformative impact of the fact that we all have these devices, these smartphones. Um, an economist in New York, Jeff Sachs, wrote provocatively that he believes that every single dollar of American overseas assistance, our foreign direct assistance, should no longer go to support this program and that program and this infrastructure and that infrastructure, it should go entirely to support the uh, infrastructure investments in broadband connectivity. Yeah. Because the productivity output, the, the GDP impact of every dollar that we put into 
creating broadband infrastructure in the developing world far exceeds on a normative basis what yeah. we get out of the similar investments in other kinds of programs. Well, first of all, what do you think of that? And also, what is it going to mean for the global economy and for the United States when 5 billion people, well, actually, when as 5 billion people are using these devices? So on, the, on, on um, Jeffrey's comment, I, I kind of lean that way. I mean, that's sort of where I go. Now, it's very interesting. You know, Bill Gates came out quite publicly last week, effectively saying, I went there thinking the Internet's going to solve everything, and no right. way. And in fact, he's not saying the Internet's not in, uh, here, but he's spending all of his time, where, by the way, top-down has relevance in things like disease eradication and other areas where people who are even barely having dumb phones, you know, just their basic things that can help humanity in very powerful ways. Like most things in life, I'm sure the truth lies somewhere between the two of them. But having said that, why I lean more towards uh, Zach's is I've just seen what's happened, you know, around the world with what people do with these devices. And, you know, this sense of empowerment, I mean, the sense that, um, you know, I'm not crazy to think the way I think, that I'm not alone in thinking the way that I'm thinking, that because my neighbor, who's a lot like me, did something and succeeded with it means that by definition I can do that. That flywheel of almost psychology, I think, is very underestimated by Gates and other people who don't understand that that fearlessness mm -hmm. and that not only fearlessness but ability to visualize one's success in action is unleashed by the broadband that you described so well. The promise and prospects of entrepreneurialism as it's expressed technologically, because it's not only expressed technologically, I'd love you to talk about the non-technical startups that you've actually explored, but let's talk about the technology startups. The underlying infrastructure for these businesses isn't just the intellectual capital, the dynamism, the WAMDA that we see in these brilliant young entrepreneurs, it's their access to things like capital, it's their access to things like electromagnetic spectrum on a sustainable yeah. basis. How are these issues being addressed and where, where do you, what's your prognosis for these two things, both capital investment on the one hand and that kind of important infrastructure on the other spectrum? The, the spectrum side I think is going to be real and bigger as adoption comes and it will bump into some of the regulatory things that you know so well and you've spent so many years thinking about. So it's hugely important. Though I will tell you that it worries me less because the access and the commitment of the private players to get this into people's hands at cost-effective business models. I mean, I, I've seen now six or seven different versions of sub-$40 smartphones. Right. And, and if you get then the data plan stuff, the economics of the data plan right, then you just know this is going to happen almost regardless of almost anything else over. I mean, what Apple is thinking about with an emerging market $300 smartphone just means that they're, they, they're playing to the elite and they're not worried about the billions that are so important. So it's real, but it doesn't worry me as much. The investments are, is a problem, right? Because in, uh, you know, there's a two-edged sword in a way to the fact that there's now 20 plus years of really sophisticated emerging market investment, right? The bad news is that returns have been very difficult. I mean, if you talk to our Silicon Valley friends, honestly, who've tried to make money in China, they're not a lot of great, clear success stories unless you got into Baidu or you got into uh, Alibaba, Yahoo. I mean, that is Yahoo's stock price, right, right. in so many ways. But it's not been easy. So the, the sword is that people are cautious. On the other hand, they know how to navigate risk. They know how to navigate political risk. They know how to deal with a lot of these circumstances that as new emerging markets rise, they could move, uh, I think, faster. But the other side of that sword is you can choose all the time where you want to go. So in other words, a smart investor will look at a great opportunity in Amman and not only compare it to other opportunities in Amman or elsewhere in the Middle East, they'll say, I've got a company doing something very similar over in Sao Paulo where I may right. have an office. And that is sort of this kind of interesting pressure. What's happening right now that I've seen in the Middle East is there's been some tradition of private equity, cash flow, businesses at scale. They're still there and more are coming. Uh, a decent amount, probably not enough, decent amount of angel money, early, 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 10, 25, 50, 100,000 dollars to get these young people up and running. The, the psychological as well as structural concern is what we call in the West the A round, that first million, two million, three million, it's really, really hard to find. This mm -hmm. is true, by the way, in a lot of emerging markets. Right. Funds are now being raised. Governments are actually looking at this question in very thoughtful ways to encourage money to come to the A round. So I don't think, again, the next five years will be the same as the last five years on that. The, um, one of our predicaments in the United States is that VCs tend to like to be within a within a, a, a drive of their companies they're investing in so that they don't have to travel far to their board meetings. Right. Is it different in the Middle East? No, I don't think so. And I think it's, um, 
Maybe it's a little bit different in the Middle East just because it's so new in that part. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think all things being equal, if you're a juggernaut in Silicon Valley and you can choose the best of the best of American innovation and our rule of law, you would be thinking a lot about wanting to be in your backyard even for the hubris that comes with it. But I think, and I asked a lot, I interviewed for about two weeks a lot of big deal folks out there, and I asked them about how they think about a world where this technology is now going to be in so many people's hands. Innovation will come elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, at first they're like, oh, we'll be there if it's a big country, you know, we've got to make money somehow. Maybe we'll be there if they're cheap labor, we'll outsource cheaply, you know, me, 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 me. But the question of what happens when really smart innovation is going to come from other corners of the world usually gets an answer like, well, they'll move to Silicon Valley. <laughs> and, you know, one of the other great phenomenons at the bottom-up world we have and what technology enables is more and more people would like to be home if they can be home and succeed. And we need to think differently about how we engage in that, not just at the government level, but at the business level. Are we beginning to see cross-border venture investment into uh, some of the Middle East companies that you're spotlighting or that are out there? Not Within just American, the region or elsewhere? Externally, from yeah. Europe, from the United States. And how are we actually doing compared to, say, the European venture capitalists, Asian venture capitalists? These are early days to really put. I mean, it's everything so relatively small. Uh, NASPERS and other South Africa groups have been lo looking very carefully here. The rocket people in Germany have built a great enterprise uh, in the Middle East, and they're from Germany and all. Um, and so you've got some of the emerging market to emerging market activity and some from the West. General Atlantic has done some significant investing, mostly in Istanbul, mm -hmm. but the companies that they've invested in now have opened up presence in the Arab world. Uh, so it's a very, very early time right now. Um, and I think it's going to be fun to watch. And it, 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 if past is prologue, we have seen significant VC, U.S. VC investment in Israeli companies. Yes. There's been a lot of spotlight focused. You know, Dan Senor and others have written about the growth in the tech sector in Israel, catalyzed by Technion, the Weizmann yeah. Institute. You've broadened the aperture, and I think that's been a great contribution. I guess my question is, is there going to potentially, can we find a metaphor here somewhere that the kind of um, cooperative borderless opportunity that can be created by engagement and partnership between Middle East, non-Israeli non Middle East com countries and companies and those that are working in and doing good work in Israel? Is there a reason for hope? Yes, there's a reason for hope, but with a tremendous caution because it's, it makes perfect sense, right? I, many people have said to me when I come back, there is no wall in the internet, and so great talent knows great talent, great entrepreneurs are great entrepreneurs, this can happen bottom up. But the fact is there's a wall physically. Mm -hmm. I'm not making a political statement, but I, they're, they're amazing entrepreneurs in Palestine. In fact, the, la the last startup weekend, which are these big gatherings that happen city by city around the world, the last startup weekend was in Gaza, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so where there is talent and where there's access, amazing things happen. And, and quietly, entrepreneur to entrepreneur, Cisco's done a couple of things more at a big company level, great talent has collaborated. But particularly in the case of Israel-Palestine, you get so caught by the political thing that I think that in many ways one has to lean back and let things happen where they happen, but not have very high expectations of it. And the very act of trying to make it, for example, part of a peace process, almost dooms it almost to instant failure. One of the important parts of your book is not only your interpretation and experience and, and personal quality that you give to your exploration of this phenomenon and the hope that you share about it, but your book actually also is a call to action. Yeah. You ask us to do stuff. Yeah. I'd love to, in my last question, personal question to Chris, read something that he wrote, which is at the end of his book, which bears repeating. If I have any one hope for startup rising, is, is that it will inspire people to rethink our conceptions of the Middle East and engage. Rethinking is proactive, not reactive. It requires regular effort to question conventional wisdom, not to dismiss it, but to check it and look forward. The great hockey legend, Wayne Gretzky, when asked what he thinks about on the ice, is said to have paused and answered, I think about where the puck is going, not where it is. I can think of no better skill to hone in the times in which we are living. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that, share your thoughts? And what is it that we can and should do as individuals here? <clears throat> well, I think the, the, the act, I mean, I don't know how many of you are Fox watchers, but you probably don't watch a lot of MSNBC. I don't know how many of you are MSNBC watchers. If you are, you probably don't watch a lot of Fox. I mean, I think a constant reminder that we do like our stories and, and whatever in and of itself has its value, particularly in terms of the Middle East, 
the ability in your businesses and the way that you vote and the way that you engage in discussions to think that the next five years is comprised merely of that has been the last five, 10, 20, 50 years, 100 years in some cases, is I think taking the eye off where there are other opportunities available to us that can be very powerful. To the business people that I talk to who are wondering how they can engage in ways, and, but this isn't just for business people, really. There is simply no substitute for going. And, and anyone who seriously wants to go, I'm easily findable. I can introduce you to a side. I mean, I'll get you to Petra. I mean, you'll see neat stuff. But I will show you something else there that is worthy of seeing. Because I think the multiplier effect, when I'm at gatherings like this, it's amazing to see people's eyes light up. Right? I mean, there's such a conventional wisdom that people don't want to hear this. And some people don't. And some journalists refuse to put me on television or write about it. And that's fine. But, but the vast majority of people are like, well, it makes, you know, Vaclav Havel has this wonderful quote I use often because it shaped my life in many ways when he said it 20 years ago. He makes a distinction between optimism and hopefulness. Optimism is effectively, it's going to happen. Woo. Hopefulness says it may not happen, and maybe often it won't happen, but it made sense. And I think that that is a way that I think about the opportunities in the Middle East and how we can engage them by thinking differently about them, going there if that is our issue and looking at how the next five years could be quite different than the last five years and remain hopeful in so doing. It is very easy in this day and age to say everything's messed up, but I actually think we're in a golden... There's no other time I'd rather be alive than now. This is an amazing time. Fantastic. We have, we have a long queue of questions for yeah, we you. Yeah, and we went over on this. I'm sorry. Uh, well, let, let, me, let me start, please, by going through some of the questions that have been texted to us which are on this board here, and then we're going to get to some of your questions. I think there's a microphone as well. Um, let's start with this question. With a current political situation, is it harder for Arab students to be admitted to Western universities? If so, what might be the impact on entrepreneurship in the Middle East? I don't have any evidence of it one way or the other. I could tell you that Nitin Araya, who's the great dean of Harvard Business School, who's done an amazing job both to encourage entrepreneurship there and uh, international emerging market efforts, generally speaking, you know, it's just a great advocate around the world. So I, I've never seen evidence of that. Good question uh, in the queue. In your view, are most of the innovations from the Middle East applicable to other regions? Or are they more focused on solving local needs? You know, I think like startups you see anywhere, the answer is both. I mean, you, you, I, in the book, I have three very quick buckets, right? I mean, one is that the most successful companies that you've seen in the Middle East are ones that have had concepts successful elsewhere. So. Maktoub was the Yahoo of the Middle East, bought by Yahoo. There's a great company called Souk.com, which looks a lot like Amazon.com. It's a huge market. It makes sense to take things that have worked elsewhere there. Second, you see these problem solvers who are solving problems that may be very applicable to their country or region, but therefore may be applicable to other emerging markets. I don't think the texting capability that it was in Kenya is going to be something that will be interesting to the United States, for example. But there are other places in emerging markets where I think it could expand. But I'll tell you, these global players like Hind, mm -hmm. those are, we're going to be talking about, you, you know, it's interesting, we don't have evidence of it to date in, in, hard, in a hardware and consumer electronics. Who would have thought 15 years ago that Korea, Japan, Finland would be major players, right? There isn't actually great global software yet, but I think it's going to happen. Having worked for the Qatar Foundation in Doha, I felt like there was an urgent focus on entrepreneurship in anticipation of the energy landscape shifting and the world relying less on oil gas. Do you feel as though that is a factor? It's a marvelous question. And, and what I can say is I hope so. I can tell you, <laughs> who, said, who asked it? You? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Look, the, the, the Saudis have been talking about revenue diversification since I've been alive. And whether we're in a stage right now, and particularly in light of the fracking, not only here but in China, where if you look at the numbers, they're really quite staggering, the drop-off. Whether or not this is going to be a different era of this, we're just going to have to see. But certainly the opportunity is there. So another question on the U.S. government's impact. How much of an impact do you feel the U.S. government's recent efforts to support entrepreneurship in the Middle East by the State Department's Global Entrepreneurship Program, et cetera, has really impacted the ecosystem? I, I don't think it can be underestimated what individuals have done. I mean, again, I made a very conscious, and it actually ticked off some of my friends in the government. I made a very concrete decision in the book to not write about any American effort. I wanted to shine light on what was happening bottom up, but in the acknowledgments, I point out, which I believe, that some of the people from the GEP, uh, there's this great guy, Mike Ducker, who was on the ground. I heard Mike Ducker's name must have been by 15 or 20 different Egyptian entrepreneurs, because not only are some of these people on the ground trying to really help constructively to connect entrepreneurs to money or to partners or that kind of stuff, there's just a tremendous moral support and right. like, go get them. 
Uh, and they, I just wish there was more of them, and I wish they were getting the resources they deserve. And speaking of moral support, a question about the Young President's Organization. Has the YPO been, in a, been as effective in opening communication and deal-making amongst entrepreneurship in Arab countries as it has been in Israel? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's been a great vehicle to broaden understanding and to make relationships. And, um, you know, it, obviously this changed my, this book would not have been written without it. And mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the activities on the ground would have been done despite it. But uh, it really has been a way, great way to just open up understanding mostly. Are there any other networking outlets besides LinkedIn for entrepreneurs in the Middle East? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the indigenous ones, a company called Bayat, B-A-Y-T, and there are startups happening in these areas all the time. And yeah. people do stuff bottom up and in connections all the time. Well, interesting. Let's talk a little bit about disconnected development, the idea that the actual creation of these mega ubiquitous global platforms may not necessarily fit neatly or nicely into the smaller economic focus that actually can drive profit rather than the massive platforms in no, I think like the, the I think the massive plas, pla, platforms, certainly like Facebook and uh, Twitter, I mean, they're almost like um, electricity or water. Right. I mean, they're, they're almost just a thing that allows people to take them and do other things with them. And sometimes it will be about the aggregate and sometimes it will be using these capabilities uh, to do more targeted stuff and both is good. What can entrepreneurs in the U.S. learn from those in the Middle East? So, first of all, I think just learning about the problem-solving capabilities in other markets. This idea that innovation and market opportunities are very bottom-up things in different places is a huge amount of teaching. Again, so many American entrepreneurs do think of emerging markets as a place to maximize their wealth and not so much about co-authorship. And this, this is really an era of co-authorship. But more to the specific point, you know, the, the Middle East is a region that never knew landlines. It's a mobile-first society. And I suspect, and I can tell you in some of the mobile payment companies I've seen there, there's a ton for, again, crow authorship and learning yep. in very powerful ways. The last thing I will tell you is there is no hubris among these entrepreneurs. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know Silicon Valley is an extraordinary place doing extraordinary things, but it's become... Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Modesty is not a big no, and, attribute. And, and modesty is, well, actually, you know, modesty is a big attribute to a lot of great entrepreneurs, but you have to be able to dream big, which right. is fine. And Silicon Valley is extraordinary. Right? I don't want to take the, I don't want to make too much of it. But what I can tell you is that there's there's a lot less of the who's up and who's down. There's some of it, but it's a different dynamic mm -hmm. when you're building. Uh, last question: How can Middle Eastern entrepreneurs enter the U.S. as some Arab businesses have faced resistance, including, despite the recent deal, platforms like Al Jazeera, yeah, which for so long could not get carriage in the United States because of not just business decisions, but cultural decisions that were being made by, about that platform. You know, there's, a, uh, there's this amazing phenomenon thing being created, which you must have known Jim Holman back in the Clinton days, who's running the U.S. Enterprise Fund for Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is just a great idea. It's a very simple, very great idea. He needs $60 million a year, and he can leverage it to other countries, and he can't get it through Congress is holding it up. Right. So we are in this environment, political environment, based on political expedience and also by lack of understanding of the changes that I've described here. And it's just tough. I don't know what to tell you. It's just very, very tough. Well, hopefully the, the culture uh, that has given us our numerical system will be able one day to access <laughs> other parts of our, you would think. Of our, our economy. Uh, I think there are some audience questions. We have a couple of more minutes. Would you please uh, distribute the microphone? Thank you. Chris, I, I'm kind of curious about the stock markets in the Middle East era. Uh, area. Uh, are there any specific countries or, or markets there that are helping leading um, startups, uh, bringing capital to, to the right people? Uh, which, which, uh, which countries are uh, among those? The largest tech base, or one of the largest tech base IPOs in the last year was AsiaCell, which is the mobile provider for Iraq, over $5 billion and going up. So there is a, it, it probably also, I'm making this up, but it probably also represents a third of the float of the market. So there's nascent stuff going. Dubai is a very serious exchange and moving. And some of the best companies are able to access, obviously, um, the other global exchanges. Right. But uh, there have not been a lot of great, I think a lot because of the Arab uprisings, there have not been a lot of great uh, public exits of yet. But I suspect we'll be seeing more of those. Uh, another question? Um, can you help me? Why don't we please wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you. 
And also, introduce yourself. Yeah, please. Hi, my name's Lily Steiner. You've obviously been to Israel, and so I'm sure you're aware that there are a lot of um, Arab um, entrepreneurs that are funded just as readily as Israeli entrepreneurs are funded. And maybe I took a little bit wrong, but when you made your fence, and I realized it was just a little joke, um, last week I was in a meeting where Israelis were smuggling themselves into Syria to bring food to Syrians. So I have no doubt that they would be more than happy to collaborate with Syrian entrepreneurs as well. So And the Syrian entrepreneurs are great. I've had young particularly young Israeli entrepreneurs have come to me and said, oh, we want to build these bridges. We're just going to do it. To which I look at them and say, do it. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a very sensitive and a very ginger topic. And I can tell you that I hear different things after they leave on the ground than what was heard going in because the reality of those sensitivities are there as well. But does that mean people shouldn't try or they don't want to try or they're not well intended in trying? Absolutely not. I think it'll be huge. Thank you. My name is Ranjit Sriprakasam. I'm from Sri Lanka. In 82, I did my first technology transfer to Sri, uh, Sri Lanka. Wow. And one of my partners was the admiral in the Iraqi Navy. Hmm. Today, I'm sitting here with a software that can broadcast you live to 60 countries as we're talking. Most people I offer this to have to talk to their publishers, their cover music people. There's a resistance. But I, yours is a very informed and very engaged program that I've just sat in on. And I would love to share this with my office in Dubai, Singapore, and London. So I was wondering if you have an objection, if I give you this app for free, download it onto your iPhone, and you broadcast it at high def at variable frame rates. I look at apps here. I'd look at any app. That would be great. That's called social networking. Thank you. <laughs> well done. More questions? Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing this to Los Angeles. Um, my name is Jennifer Cushell. I, um, I've been working with the State Department's Global Entrepreneur Program, traveling throughout the Middle East, so this is fascinating. One of my questions, I was in Malaysia the other week at the Global Entrepreneur Congress speaking on women's entrepreneurship. One, one fascinating thing to me is a lot of the young women who are technology entrepreneurs are coming up to me saying, I want to explore entrepreneurial culture in America. And one young woman I spoke with just last week, with the most passionate person I've talked to, and you know they're all very passionate, full of baya, just the slits, you know, for the eyes, and she's mm. dying to study nanotechnology in America. What do you think the reception is going to be from the American startup community when more and more young women who are fully covered because of their religious beliefs start to come into Silicon Beach and explore the culture? I mean, people are people, and I'm sure they're folks with bias. But if, if they're here, they will get meetings. And if they're here and they have great ideas and they're hungry, they will get meetings. What follow-up will come is sometimes more difficult. But that has nothing to do with them being women or covered. That just has to do. I, I brought, there were several, Omar knows some of these companies from Egypt. His father, by the way, is Ahmed Alfi, who I mentioned before. And um, I got this very interesting response to these venture capitalists who had met these young entrepreneurs, some of whom were women. And they said, first of all, amazing people. Secondly, really interesting ideas. Thirdly, I don't know how to back them. I just don't have the infrastructure yet in place to figure it out. Actually, to your question, one of my favorite answers, which is probably about 10 years away, maybe five years away, was that one person said, man, these guys are unbelievable. Can I show them to my Tel Aviv office? <laughs> to which the entrepreneurs are like, not yet. Right. And I would just say that on this day of, of both remembrance and, and thanks for service of our military, which we, and uh, of our veterans. Thank you for your service to our country. Yeah, no question about that. Another question? Gary uh, Awad, to, to what extent is uh, are the recent changes in Islamic financing, uh, Sharia compliant financing, a help or a hindrance? To I, I, I can't speak intelligently about it. You know, most of the startups that I deal with is equity financing. So I saw some really interesting debates that were happening about later stage financing and that kind of a thing. But I can't give a strong opinion about how it's changed or if it's worse. To the contrary, I think Chris we has shown himself to be able to speak intelligently just about on any subject. Not this. Um, I just want to say thank you, Chris. Well, thanks, buddy. But, but let me start by saying 
Well, we're going to do another round. But let me also say thank you to our friends and colleagues here at the Milken Institute for providing this forum, for opening our eyes, and for being able Absolutely. to give us. So, Skip, thank you very much. Yes, Skip, to amazing. Our colleague Nancy Oseas and others here. Um, one last thought as we move forward. You know, you mentioned that the idea is not to only focus on where the puck is, but where it's going to go. Yeah. And that's an important thing for all of us to think about, not only at home, but globally. And I would just like to memorialize that with this little puck. Awesome. That I will hope. This is my favorite thing <laughs> on this whole thing. That's you will, awesome. Uh, you will follow. And, and, and that you, give, give, you have given all of us a lot of food for very, very oh, rich thought. Fantastic. Thank you very yeah, much, Chris. Awesome. If, if, could I say just one other very quick? And, and I mean, authors always say, buy my book, buy my book. But as he pointed out, I am giving all the proceeds away. Rewad, which even if you don't buy the book, Google it, because it's a social enterprise in Amman in one of the poorest refugee areas that is a community center that is lighting the community on fire. It's of and for the community. They teach each other. They train each other. They're getting technological training. Uh, they have these amazing sessions where young people gather just to have real discussions about the societal issues. They're going to try to open one in Tripoli. Syria is making it a little bit difficult now. They've got one in uh, Boudros in Palestine one in the poorest area of Cairo that is being open. So um, it's the holiday season. Buy my book. Buy his book. Thank you. One final round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.